Now we move on to the session titled Digital Revolution, Inclusive Growth and Digital Public Infrastructure. Uh, technology can catalyze social transformation and affect economic progress. And in this session, we deliberate on how the digital revolution can affect growth and progress for all. We have two very interesting uh, trigger presentations. The first by Shal Sharma, who is the co-founder, and as I call out your name, please uh, come on stage. First by Sharad Sharma, who is a co-founder of iSprit, chair T20 task force on our common digital future, affordable, accessible, and inclusive digital public infrastructure. Uh, Sharad is also one of our foremost public technologists, and shall I say the, the, the brain behind the India stack. Uh, the second is Karthik Raghupati, the head of strategy and investor relations uh, at PhonePay in India, and PhonePay is one of India's uh, uh, pioneering payment apps. Karthik, welcome on stage. Just, uh, just to reiterate a few rules of the road, uh, the presenters will have 10 minutes each. Uh, the the, the uh, expert interventions would be around four minutes each, so please keep time, uh, because this is what stands between us and lunch. So may I now invite uh, Sharad for his trigger presentation. You know, DPI is a new term. And if you actually put the whole thing inside Google Trends, it says, hmm, we don't have enough data about it. So it's so new. And if you put them as three terms, it will show you something. And of course, the top searches are coming from India. Second set of searches are coming from Philippines. And I would ask you to wonder why. And I'll give you the answer towards the end of the talk. And the third and the fourth are from US and Canada, right? So, so the question is, this is a new term. It's like ESG back in the early days. You know, it's, since it's a new term, it means different things to different people. But luckily, public infrastructure is not a new term. So let me just kind of take you very quickly through the arc of history so that I can talk a little bit about how did we arrive at this term? Because that will probably inform you know, some of your thinking about how to think about it and how to deal with it as we go forward. So let me take you back to, you know, the world war has ended. There is lots of building that is taking place all across the world. There is, however, a lot of confusion as to what constitutes public infrastructure. You know, is railways public infrastructure or is it private infrastructure? Is roadways public infrastructure or can it also be private infrastructure? Ports, airports, this is the discussion that is happening, which eventually gets settled in 1956 when the US President Eisenhower has the Interstate uh, Act, which at that time was described as the world's largest public works project. And it kind of settled this debate that a lot of this transportation infrastructure that we talk about is indeed public infrastructure. Because, you know, if US thinks it's public infrastructure, everybody else usually anyway was on that path. They are the last ones to accept something as public infrastructure. Now, I, I, you know, so this was the first kind of wave, first, first place where this discussion was happening. And now fast forward another 25 years. I take you to 1981. Right? And, uh, and in 1981, there is British Telecom, which is a telecom company, sees itself as providing public infrastructure, public telecom infrastructure. On the other side is AT&T. You know, I, I started my engineering in 82, so I was not working for AT&T at that time. But later in time, I was working for AT&T Bell Labs, so I can tell you the story from my my time uh, there in that company, AT&T saw itself as providing private telecom infrastructure. Both were providing telecom infrastructure. British Telecom public, that's the conception, came out of British ports, posts, and is set up in that way. AT&T, the world's largest telecom company at that time, providing private infrastructure. And at that time, there was this tussle taking place. Is telecom private infrastructure or is it public infrastructure? How should we think about it? And many of you may know in 82, 1982, this issue was settled because the antitrust case against at and succeeded. at and was broken up into baby bells, as many of you know. And that changed the narrative substantially all across the world. 
And those of you who follow tech history know that this shift from ARPANET to internet was substantially influenced by this antitrust decision that had taken place. So in, in mid 80s, when that transition took place, that, that allowed this community which saw internet as a public infrastructure to actually succeed. And you know, in fact, those of you who are familiar with this, this happened very soon after the case, because on 1st of Jan, some people regard 1st of January 1983 as the start of the internet because in 1982 is when that case had been settled, right? So, so there was a conversation at that time happening, whether it's public infrastructure, private infrastructure. Now, fast forward a little further. You, go, you come to 1992. By the time mobile telephony started taking off, first in Scandinavia, Sweden, you know, and in 92, everybody was making a beeline to see what this new animal is, you know, mobile telephony. And the discussion was a settled discussion that it should be considered as public infrastructure. And so therefore those conversations that happen is who gets the license? How do we allocate spectrum within the country? Is it a public good and therefore should we allocate a lot of spectrum, little spectrum? Should we, you know, should we think about what kind of regulation should we do for people who win the license? What do, you, what do we do you know, with technology choices? Should they be left to the operators or should it be a national choice? These were all questions that were informed by this idea that had taken root 10 years ago that telecom infrastructure is not private infrastructure but is public infrastructure. Now let's fast forward to today's time. This discussion is happening all over again. And this discussion started in India literally 10 years ago uh, in, in 2013. And in India at that time, amongst the people, you know, mostly out of Bangalore, Karthik is also from uh, Bangalore. You know, this was a discussion happening in Bangalore here in India. And, and very quickly we decided that not all digital infrastructure is digital public infrastructure. For example, cloud infrastructure was doing very well, AWS was thriving in, at that time. So the question was, is cloud infrastructure private infrastructure, public infrastructure? Very soon consensus built, it is public infrastructure. But when it came to the next piece, which was digital infrastructure that mediates the flow of people in our society, which is digital identity, not physical identity, but digital identity, there was a consensus that that is public infrastructure. And I would suggest to you that consensus is now fairly broad consensus. You know, World Bank runs a program called ID4D. India has an offering for countries outside called MOSIP. You can check it out at mosip.io, parked in IIIT Bangalore, Indian Institute of Technology, uh, in, you know, what is it, full form? In, huh? information technology uh, uh, in Bangalore, and it's available, 10 countries use it. And uh, uh, so, so therefore, that idea, and if you look at G20, I would submit 18 of the 20 countries fully endorse this idea that, you know, mediating the flow of people in society through digital identity is probably public infrastructure. India took one more leap. In 2016, when it launched the payment solution, and, and Karthik is from that area, uh, you know, we took a decision that something that mediates the flow of money in our society, that digital infrastructure is also public infrastructure. It was very controversial at that time. Why? Because the companies were Visa, MasterCard, Alipay, WeChat Pay. They were all private infrastructure companies not public infrastructure companies. They resisted this, this fought this. And I let Karthik describe the success of UPI. And although this is not a settled debate, I think a lot of this conversation is moving towards this fact that perhaps we should think of it as public infrastructure. The last piece which India introduced in September of 2021 is called the account aggregator. The underlying protocol is called DEPA. That is mediating the flow of personal data across our society. India believes that's public infrastructure. There are some countries who also believe that, but that issue is not resolved at all. So in some sense, we are in this period, which has happened at least two times before, 
where there is a healthy debate taking place, is it public infrastructure, is it private infrastructure. Now, in India, we have learned, you know, the pros and cons of this. And if you have something as public infrastructure, there are definitely some benefits. Akartik will talk about that a little while from now. But there are also risks that come in. One of the big risks is authoritarianism. So if you have that infrastructure run by, by, by the government, you know, it can change the balance of power between the citizen and the state. So we've had to deal with it because our Supreme Court has looked at Aadhaar three times and given it a clean shit every time, but has looked at it three times. And we've learned from that experience. So subsequent efforts in payments and data haven't created the same angst and controversy in our civil society. Why? Because we learned how to build into our regulations and into our technology, public technology, protections that prevent that authoritarianism from happening. So that's one. Second, we decided that even though it's public infrastructure, like mobile phones, like our airports, it is privately provisioned public infrastructure, which means they're capped profits. And if they're capped profits, will there be enough animal spirit, especially for UPI? UPI is free for all of us to use. So it is yet privately provisioned. You have a private company sitting in front of you. So how do they make money? And how, if they, are they making too much money? No, if it's making too much money, it probably doesn't qualify as public infrastructure. And if they're not making any money, there are no animal spirits, then having provided pri private provisioning of this doesn't make sense at all. So how to strike that balance? How to make sure that if it's privately provisioned, monopolization will not happen? And the fact that we then went out and built MOSIP inside a university so that other countries could use it, we had to deal with the third risk which is weaponization. Those countries, which, and by the way, the biggest user of MOSIP is Philippines, and therefore that search term uh, is, is uh, from, you know, Philippines uses DPI very aggressively. I am guessing that is the reason why it scores high on, on, on Google search. Uh, it, and, and the reason is Philippines is happy to take this technology which was born in India, but it doesn't want a situation where India tomorrow can weaponize it. And you know, weaponization of public technology, private technology has been happening at a scale that we have never seen before in the last 10 years. You know, we've had countries, we have weaponized it with their friends. Earlier, it would be only for North Korea and, and you know, Iran, but, you know, Turkey was a victim of it and other countries have been victims of it. And so, so their weaponization is very top of the mind for people. And we've learned how to deal with that also in MOSIP as we go forward. So there are certain principles that have emerged. The principles are techno-legal regulation, principles are open networks, open protocols, creating specific institutions like NPCI, like Sahamati, which will allow for these ecosystems to thrive. So there are certain principles that have emerged. And it is only when you evaluate this India experience and these principles, will you be able to determine that on balance, would you like this to be public infrastructure or private infrastructure? Because if you do it without the India experience, then you'll either only see the good points or the bad points. If you want a nuanced view, you have to be able to examine what's working and not working here in India. So this is the story that is play, taking place here. And G20 is for uh, acting as a precipitating kind of a, you know, moment for resolving this issue. I think a consensus will build that foundational digital public infrastructure, which is flow of people, money, and information will be public infrastructure. And there'll be a body of knowledge that will emerge on how to make it work in many, many countries. And this is the moment that we are here for. And uh, so I'm going to stop here. And, uh, 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 and conclude by saying that this is really, really a wonderful time. Think guiding principles, think pros and cons, and every country has to make its own decision whether they would like to view this as private infrastructure or public infrastructure. Thank you so much. <laughs>
India is undoubtedly in its golden age. Uh, it's an age that is being driven and will be driven by the digital economy of India. India is creating, and we've just heard this, it's creating a modern, globally unparalleled technology infrastructure that connects all Indians. It's truly democratic. It's making sure that every section of society is getting the benefits of technology. And over the last few years, public investments in building these rails, the rails of the digital economy, paired with cutting edge innovation from private sector participants have really made this happen. This model of digital public infrastructure or DPI will propel India over the next 25 years as well as we reach our 100 years of independence. And perhaps there is no better exemplar of this model than UPI. Unified Payments Interface or UPI is one of India's flagship products that has become a global case study for how to create population scale impact through technology and public-private partnerships. And as market leaders of UPI at PhonePay, which is a private company, we have a ringside view of how digital payments has transformed the industry, has transformed the nation. And today, I'd like to extend this ringside view to all of you. In 2021, we launched a product called PhonePay Pulse. It's India's first and only geospatial interactive data platform on digital payments. You can go check it out. It's on pulse.phonepay.com. And it showcases the breadth and depth of the Indian digital payments ecosystem. Today, about 40% of our payments by value is digital. And that's about a $3 trillion digital payments market. By 2026, this is going to more than triple. Essentially, it's going to hit 10 trillion. Yeah, T trillion with a T. Uh, and that means by 2026, two out of three transactions in the nation will be digital. The aspirations of our citizens, the progress of our economy, will all be captured in how the nation spends. Here's how the pulse of progress that we are seeing is unfolding at PhonePay. We have about 450 million registered users. More than one in three adult Indians are on the platform. So what we see is representative of the nation. Through PhonePay Pulse, we bring out those data, the, the insights, as well as the stories that captures the vibrancy of the Indian economy. With its rich repository of trends, insights, and stories, Pulse showcases India's beat of progress and today, I'd like to give you some of the highlights of our nation's rapid growth. India is leading the largest digital transformation in the world. And this growth of New India is democratic. It's inclusive. It is bottom up. To bring this point to life, let me take you through four different vantage points of India's growth. The first is a socioeconomic perspective. A trucker's journey across India shows us how empowering digital payments have become. Through Pulse, we discovered a truck driver who paid for fuel 75 times at 75 different gas stations across 13 states in the nation. Think about that for a minute as to what that means. This trucker did not have to carry a lot of petty cash. This truck driver did not need his company to do any kind of expense reimbursements. He could get reimbursed for all his expenses in real time. And best of all, open data now allows us to take a look at the ebb and flow of commerce, of people, and transactions across the country. So that's the first vantage point, a socioeconomic vantage point. The second is a geographic perspective. This transformation is across the length and breadth of India. Digital payments is a pan-India entity. From chaiwalas to kirana stores to large merchants, from salaries to shagun, from paying rent to investing, UPI has seen adoption amongst literally a wide demographic. And it has been particularly interesting to see how fast tier three towns and beyond are growing. Let me share some examples. Nanda Devi, which is in the Chamoli district in northern India, which is actually known for being the highest altitude in the country, witnessed over a 60% year-over-year growth in Q3 2021. In that same quarter, Mizoram, which you see here, in the northeast part of India, 
witnessed the highest average transaction value in the nation. In fact, in the Northeast, UPI has now become the most popular mode of payment because more than 60% of the about 1.5 million merchants in that part of the country are now digitized. So that's the second vantage point, geographic inclusion. The third vantage point, gender, and I know this is a topic later today as well, women are a big part of this revolution. We have witnessed over three years a 6x growth in transactions from women. Over the last three years, that means an 85% CAGR, and that is on par with men. It is literally the same. As an example, today, Geeta, one of our users who runs a tailoring shop in Coimbatore in South India, is no longer dependent on her male family colleagues to either deposit money or withdraw money or even having to go to a bank at all. Digital payments have brought efficiency in her daily activities, having to manage multiple responsibilities at home and at work. Geeta is just one amongst the millions of stories of women in India who are driving India's digital revolution. The fourth and potentially one of the most important vantage points in India's digital payments revolution is the offline merchant, or as is frequently called, the Kirana merchant. They are the backbone of our digital payments. Merchant payments today constitute a significant share. Uh, they represent about 20% by value of Indian digital payments, but they will get to north of 60% in the next four years. We have digitized about 35 million merchants across 99% PIN codes in the country, and I can tell you for sure this is a very real trend in the country. It is literally, you will be hard pressed to find a store in India that does not accept UBI. A good example of how quickly our stores are getting digitized, this is an example of a grocery store in Ahmedabad that accepts over 350 digital payments a day, which means in a month, they're accepting more than 10,000 digital payment transactions. That's a small grocery store in the country. That's how pervasive digital payments have become here. Our country's growth is not just bottom up. Despite all the massive numbers you hear about UPI, this is just the beginning. As digital payments unlocks financial inclusion from the bottom up, the next frontier, which we believe will happen, is insurance. The pandemic showed us how insurance is a critical financial services product. In India, it's a product that's perceived as largely being bought by people in tier one cities in the country, while needing a constant push for awareness in smaller towns and smaller cities. However, recently, as the digital rails have been laid out across the nation, insurance and other financial products have become accessible across the nation. A few simple taps on a smartphone is all that is required to get an insurance policy, and that's rapidly transforming the insurance landscape especially with small towns taking the lead in every category, whether it's life, health, or motor insurance. And you can see the rapid growth here on the screen in just how it's happened over the last three years. And this is insurance data. People in small towns are much better connected. They're well equipped with the necessary information. They're aware, and they know how to make decisions and now how to purchase products that are in the financial services realm, not just payments. For example, in Q4 2022, literally a few months ago, Ernakulam, which is a district in Kerala, ranked in the top 10 districts in the country in terms of insurance policies bought. This is just the beginning. There are many open, interoperable systems that are being built in India. Sharad mentioned quite a few. To name a few, ONDC for democratizing co uh, commerce, OKEN, the Open Credit Enable Net uh, Enablement Network for opening up credit, an account aggregator, or AA, for personal data. Finally, I'd like to actually share an example of the power of open data itself. Um, so we've talked about open systems, but I'd like to talk about open data too, uh, of which Pulse is an example. This graph here shows something fairly intuitive. This is transactions at offline merchants during the first wave of the pandemic in early 2020, and the second wave of the pandemic in mid-2021. It's fairly intuitive that you see a drop during the pandemic because of the lockdowns that happened. But, and so it's not very surprising. But what happens when you unpeel the data a little bit more, when you peel the onion, 
is that the growth was actually driven in offline transactions by tier three and not by tier one and two cities, which is contrary to popular perception. What you see here is a breakdown of what you saw in the previous chart, but specifically for the first lockdown. Tier three markets were actually allowed to operate. They were what's in the green zone and they were not fully shut down. And what you can see here is that because the stores were allowed to operate, these markets really accelerated the adoption of digital payments. Insights such as these using open data platforms are game changers for ecosystem shapers like policymakers, like architects, like companies, as well as uh, investors. To conclude, I think they say the proof is in the pudding and I think the data actually gives you that evidence. I hope you found this presentation valuable and eye-opening. Our philosophy at PhonePay is very much along the lines of what Sharat talked about. It's open democratizing progress across India, but also inspiring people globally. This philosophy is what led us to create Pulse, and I invite you all to visit pulse.phonepay.com and join us in having a ringside seat to witness India's fascinating digital revolution. Thank you. Thank you, Karthik. We now move to the expert interventions. The first is by Joanna Weaver, Director, Tech Policy Design Center, Australian National University. Hello. Okay. Thank you very much. Third time, fourth time lucky. Um, thank you. Uh, it's a real honor to be here, especially speaking after our two esteemed panelists. Um, Sharad Sharma uh, is someone who I've had the pleasure of engaging with. And in my previous life, uh, I worked uh, as Australia's uh, chief cyber negotiator, and I travelled the world talking to technologists and policy makers. And I have never met a technologist who can talk about policy in the way that Sharad does. Uh, and I think that is really a very important characteristic. I wanted to pick up on a few of the themes um, that uh, have been discussed, uh, and in particular looking at this question of uh, public uh, infrastructure and the importance of that infrastructure being public. We all learnt during the 90s and the, and the early noughties that if we leave technologists to their own devices, we're unlikely to come up with technology that necessarily makes the world a better place. We've moved into an era where we're seeking to regulate technology, rightly, so that we have checks and balances on power. We've also realised that we really need to strengthen our democracies. And without question, over the last uh, three days, we've heard many different perspectives on what is a democracy, what are those core values. But I think there are a few people who would disagree with the fact that at the core democracies are about having checks and balances on power. That no power, there's no ultimate power that rests with one person or uh, one institution. What is so exciting to me about digital public infrastructure is that it allows us both to drive economic growth and to build into the future public infrastructure those checks and balances on power. So Sharad spoke about having open public infrastructure um, the open, for those of you who are not techies, is really important. What that means is that the code is open and available so that it is accountable and transparent, as opposed to a lot of the technology that is built by technology companies where that code is private and proprietary and we can't actually see what is actually happening behind, um, behind the hood. The public technology is really important. I am uh, a person who very much comes down on the side of uh, that our, um, our, our digital identities, our payments, and our data should be public infrastructure. I wanted to speak briefly, though, about um, the regulatory frameworks that we have and the importance of building the checks and balance into the regulatory frameworks. Because the open and the public acts as a check and a balance on the technologists, I also really think it's important that as we build this type of technology that we also have checks and balances on the governments and those that are regulating. And I know this is something that uh, is built into MOSIP and some of the other structures. But it's about saying we need to have consent over the use of the data. We need to have lawful access to that data. 
And I think there are three principles um, that we need to think about when we're looking at um, regulating these, uh, these digital public goods to ensure that we're shaping them in a democratic way rather than leaning towards authoritarian, authoritarianism. Um, because the model that India is offering to export to the world, let's face it, is also a model that is in direct competition to models that are being exported by countries like China. So this is actually about shaping the future of the world in which we live in, not just about who pays with what, what device or what does your digital identity look like. So there are three things that I think are really important. The first is that we need to have transparency in uh, the lawful access. So we need to have lawful access exemptions to digital public goods, but we need to have transparency about when those provisions are used. So publishing information that says um, this, there have been you know, 11 warrants issued in this particular, uh, for this access to this particular information. The second is that we need to have um, the right to appeal of decisions that are made based on public authorities on the information that is collected. There needs to be appeal mechanisms that are available and it needs to be independent appeal mechanisms. And the third piece is that we need to have regulatory oversight. We need to have someone watching the watchers. So in uh, all of the public infrastructure that India has, there is various different regulators that are built in looking at the system. We need to make sure that there's also independent oversight of those regulators. Sure and now we should prep. That's my last point. Uh, and with those three things, if we have um, uh, transparency, if we have the right to appeal, and if we have um, uh, people watching the watchers, this infrastructure really has the ability to transform uh, and democratise uh, the future of the world in which we'll live in. So um, congratulations again to India for what you have done. Thank you, Joanna. May I now call upon Yung Jun Song, the Executive Director, Innovative Economy Forum at the Republic of Korea. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to congratulate India, Mr. Joint Secretary, uh, on um, the India's initiative, Startup 20. Uh, for record purpose, Mr. Joint Secretary, B20 as it is today, uh, as a process, not as a one-off meeting, was Korea's initiative in 2010. Correct, yes. Well, let me start by uh, uh, paraphrasing uh, Mr. Amit, no, sorry, Amitabh Kant's uh, remarks that the G20 is not a UN. I don't want the G20 to become another UN. We need a G20 that's working, that's working for the global community. So instead of saying, you know, this is good, this is bad, uh, that is bad, uh, we should do this, we should do that, I think we should deliver. And um, I do agree uh, and support the multi-stakeholder approach as, as far as possible, uh, uh, but, it should not become unwieldy, and it should become a functioning body. Uh, we need a um, concrete action plan and deliver it. I'll just focus on um, the uh, 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 on, on the, uh, uh, digital uh, literacy and capacity uh, building, especially for women and girls. Uh, for that, I'd like to uh, propose, uh, suggest the uh, India G20 uh, to consider, uh, let's say, a three-year action plan with an X amount of uh, uh, dollars of G20 and X percentage of G20 SDG and development funds to be channeled into digital literacy and capacity building of women and girls in, let's say, uh, uh, perhaps 20 developing countries. I think India can take this as an India as an India's initiative, concrete initiative. I don't know. Maybe you may be already working on this uh, concrete uh, project, but I I would like India to consider this sort of uh, initiative. And how to pull the resources? Well, being in the G20, bring in the G20 donors and uh, MDBs and whoever wants to be in the discussion, in the process, a, a, a multi-stakeholder approach, but as I said, uh, do not extend 
too much. And, um, and, and report the progress, uh, interim progress, to uh, the uh, summit meeting as well as uh, to the you know, finance, uh, short part, uh, development tracks. Uh, and um, I, I want India to be the champion of development and boost G20's legitimacy and effectiveness and revitalize the G20 itself. Thank you. Thank you, Jun Jun. I now call upon Shering Sige Dorji, the ICT domain lead at the Sung Skilling Program of Bhutan. Thank you. Um, I would like to see myself as representing a small state and the LDCs coming from one. So small states and LDCs uh, such as Bhutan have the same digital dream as the G20 countries do. Uh, for Bhutan, digital is really a top priority and a top agenda. Uh, although a late entrant in the, in the world of technology, Bhutan today has achieved 100% mobile penetration rate, has a nationwide fiber optic network over power transmissions, transmission lines using OPGW technology, and uh, many public services are available online, and e-payments are widely adopted. Yet, uh, I would like to put on record that small states and LDCs uh, face various challenges um, either due to the lack of resources, um, the lack of infrastructure, or for small states, the lack of economies of scale, which can be a real challenge for a country with a small population like Bhutan. Uh, as a result of that, I, I see four challenges. Firstly, a uh, lot of the countries, a uh, lot of the different parts of countries, uh, uh, poor countries, are not covered by the mobile network or or the you know the uh, the cable network, so there is no connectivity in the first place. Secondly, even if there is connectivity, there are a lot of people who cannot afford a mobile uh, device, a smartphone, or a, a laptop. Uh, I can see this challenge even in Bhutan, and there are a lot of countries around the world I think where this is a real challenge for a lot of the population. Thirdly, even if you have a device and the connectivity, sometimes there, there are no online public services platform to avail the services from. So this is where I think uh, the examples that India has just cited, I think, uh, uh, shows a way, way forward for these countries. Last but not, but not the least, even if we have the earlier three things, uh, many people lack the skills they don't have the digital literacy or the digital skills to make use of these technologies. So uh, a lot of effort is needed in maybe imparting the skills, imparting the basic digital, digital literacy skills, which are very necessary in this day and age. So I think we have to try and overcome this uh, uh, gap. And really, my suggestion to the G20 forum here today is to mine this gap and look for ways to uh, you know, help overcome these challenges in the spirit of Vasudaiva, uh, Vasu, Vasudaiva, <laughs> Vasudaiva Kutumbakam. And uh, yesterday at the conference, one of the ministers, very articulate, um, Mrs. Minakshi Leke, uh, talked about an piyode, leave no one behind. So I would like to request that we try to overcome these challenges in this spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Sharing. We now call upon Nera Dali Chaus, the president of Vemtech France, on the RD agenda. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, so yeah, I'm a president of Wimtech, which is Mediterranean Women Tech Entrepreneurs, and uh, also Secretary General of Women in AI. So as you can hear it, I'm a women's rights advocate. So all the question of uh, having an inclusive growth is part of all the work that I'm trying to do. Um, so 
I'm gonna jump on some point that uh, you raised uh, during your presentation and also the comment that we have. Um, I think this question of building a digital uh, digital future with all this digital public infrastructure is a global question. And it's a global responsibility and we need to put the human at the center. And the, our digital world is a reflection of our reality. So either we can make it reflect all the problems and all the inequalities, or we can try to handle all these inequalities. So, yes, for me it's very important to insist on that, to say that all that we do, with the G20 and India especially trying to do, we need to be, make sure that human and underrepresented and uh, vulnerable communities, firstly um, women for me, would be part of it. And also I like the, um, the position from someone like the intervention before about having a well plan uh, and a concrete plan about what we can do uh, and how we can build digital uh, public goods. And uh, for me, the fact of having, um, ensuring an, inclusive, uh, an inclusiveness in this work uh, need to come through being intentional on how we design these digital public uh, goods. Being intentional in the way the people, the teams that will create these uh, this public goods need to be representing the world that we want to create. We need to be diverse in terms of genders, in terms of cultures, in terms of everything so we can replicate them and create the, the new future that we want to create. So, uh, yeah, I want to ensure that and to insist on that because for me it's the, the fight, my daily, uh, my day-to-day -day, uh, fight. And um, also another point, I think the, we spoke about the transparency and the responsibility because the G20 building and ha leading this, uh, uh, this work comes also with uh, a responsibility of being the one who's sharing the good examples, who's sharing the support, and we need to have this thinking globally but to ensure local application with also an independency because every country that will use this public, uh, digital public goods need to be uh, sure that they are keeping their independence in the way they, uh, they, uh, they use them. Otherwise, we're going to not embrace all of this, uh, global, uh, this global topic. That's it. Thank you, Nero. Okay. May I now call upon Dennis Suarsana, Country Director, Indonesia and Timor List at CAS of Germany. Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, yeah, so there's not much to add to uh, what my, the speakers before me said, but I still have to fill my uh, four minutes. Um, so I will uh, share some experiences uh, from, from Indonesia and also from Europe, if I may. Um, before I came here to Delhi, I, I, uh, I attended a, a training that we were conducting with the Indonesian Ministry of Home Affairs, and it was a training for civil servants from regional governments um, in Indonesia on managing innovation in the public sector. And what I learned there and what surprised me is that the biggest problem is uh, for them is that uh, they are building digital solutions in the public sector, but these solutions are not being used by the citizens. So, uh, and I was wondering why, why that is, and uh, I, I learned that there's still the very traditional sentiment that uh, digital public uh, services and digital public infrastructure has to be uh, designed and provided by the public sector. And um, so the problem, of course, is that, this, that, that they're still following a very traditional uh, approach when it comes to implementing and designing these, uh, these processes. And uh, the, the end user experience is not really central to this approach. Um, and uh, I thought that this is not much different than, uh, to, to Europe. So in Europe, the, the sentiment is also very broadly shared uh, that, that uh, the public sector somehow is uh, uh, able to, to develop better solutions than the market. And that's why uh, in Europe there are so many initiatives, uh, some of the most prominent, developing an e European Union facilitated public cloud, Gaia X, as, a, as a com com competing with, with AWS and all of them. And there's, uh, recently there has been talks about 
building an EU facilitated alternative to Twitter or to YouTube and, and that's based on the same thinking that, that the public sector is somehow superior to the, to the market and can build better solutions and I think that, that the main lesson, at least for me, from, uh, from the Indian, Indian um, uh, success story with regard to, to your uh, digital public infrastructure is that, that you have to get in the, public, uh, the private sector and that you have to, uh, well, also, not maybe not trust, but still build upon market solutions and not, not thinking about being able to, to build better solutions uh, in the public sector. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. May I call upon uh, Berta Yarasova to make her intervention? She is a cyber attache to the United States and Canada, the National Cyber and Information Security Agency of the Czech Republic. Hello. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. Hello, thank you for your presentations. Uh, I come from the Czech Republic, a uh, EU member state of 10 millions. Um, and I just want to uh, congratulate India on your digital transformation. It's been very inspiring and impressive to hear about uh, your approach. Uh, we just announced um, the establishment of Czech Digital Agency. We have no digital ID yet and there is this whole road ahead of us. And we are just a country of 10 million and it still seems like a big challenge, so very inspiring. I want to make uh, four points, um, departing from the context of cybersecurity, because that's my background and my job. So I think when you talk about um, digital infrastructure, whether public or private, we also need to ensure protection, resilience, and readiness of the digital infrastructure. Um, coming from Central Europe, I have to mention the Russian aggression against Ukraine. And I think the cyber um, and digital um, dimension of the war uh, has really underlined the need for resilience. And I also think one of the ideas um, uh, that I was thinking about is a possibility to promote a global norm on the protection of the public digital infrastructure to ensure that actually citizens have access uh, to this infrastructure in peacetime, in crisis time, but also in wartime. Uh, second point relates to supply chain security in the context of ICTs, a topic that is very, really important for the Czech Republic, something we have uh, promoted during our presidency of the Council of the EU and that is to make sure that we use uh, tools and technologies that uh, reflect our values, our democratic values, as you mentioned many times. And I think not every country is um, uh, able to uh, quickly develop their own technologies and there are areas, including the 5G, where we rely on um, suppliers from other continents and countries. So I think um, uh, we need to avoid building dependencies on suppliers that do not share our values. Uh, third, um, I want to just echo the comment on including uh, women and girls in, in the building of workforce in technology and cyber, because ultimately that is the enabler for innovation, but also their empowerment. And the final comment, I think um, yesterday there, were panel, there was a panel uh, on the same topic, and we've heard about the three existing models, um, kind of aligned, but still different. Data for profit in the United States, data for regulation in the EU, and data for development in um, India. Uh, and I think despite our differences, uh, we have to aim uh, to, to look for what we share, and that is the democratic approach and the multi-stakeholder approach. And I think this is something we need to um, build a coalition of like-minded countries um, around in order to counter the authoritarian um, uh, ambitions. Thank you. Thank you, Berta. May I now call upon Sikshit Bhatia for his intervention. He's the co-founder and CEO of Tutal Nepal. Hi, good afternoon. I come from Nepal, so it's a country where you know, you can be by the side of a banana tree and take a photo with Everest in the backdrop. Uh, which also means that uh, there's a huge divide, right? Which means the cost, the per capita cost of providing 
connectivity in the Gangetic Plains is totally different to what you do in the mountains. So we need to have right kind of strategies by which we can have that connectivity there. Right? And the second also, I would echo the thought of my friend from Bhutan who said uh, that the second challenge, of course, is about uh, literacy. If you have the connectivity, we do not have the literacy. So how do you bridge that gap? So we need to have these two policies there. But more importantly, you know, these, are, these are the problems that we can identify and we can know that we are not included. But the bigger challenge today, I think, we see is that when you look at the app, you know, when we know that technology should not differentiate one another, and it looks the same in the app, but the algorithms are differentiating you. Because the, the power of the algorithms do not account for the historical prejudices and historical biases. For example, you could have an algorithm if you are running an HR company to exclude women who live five kilometers away from the center of the town uh, to be shortlisted for a job. And then it becomes a self-feeding algorithm which will leave women behind. So, and, and the knowledge of that data and the knowledge of these algorithms only rest on few people. So it's just like a Catholic church before the Reformation where the Bible was written in, in Latin, which was not accessible to many people, before the Gothenburg printing press came in, and then it was translated widely to be understood by people. So we need to make sure how these algorithms are accessible to people in terms of the knowledge of these algorithms. So this is another very vital point. Uh, at the same time, you know, when we design the algorithm, it's just like uh, making food. So when my mom cooks food for me, and yes, in our places, our mom still feeds us, uh, if she has the same ingredients, that the outcome of that algorithm, if the process of cooking is an algorithm, is the quality of food and the health and hygiene of their children. But if you give the same algorithm to the chef in a kitchen of a five-star hotel, uh, his or her algorithm would be to profit the hotel or a restaurant. So, so when we come up with our policies, it is very important that we design the policies and algorithms as a mother and not, not as a chef. So that's very important, right? <laughs> but having said that, you know, again, coming from the Asian side, you know, I'm also a big fan of uh, Sanskrit and our own ideologies because the Western models so far were developed on the ethics of individuality, which led to the profiteering of individual organizations because it was led by the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness as the ethics of individuality. What we have here is not the ethics of individuality. It is about the ethics of community where we can sacrifice our individual benefits for the betterment of over, overall community. And this is one of the slogans I would leave you with and I think that all the entrepreneurs, all the policy makers who deal with inclusion take it with them just following up with the Basudhaiva Kutumbakam is Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina, Sarve Santu Niramay. May everyone be happy and may everyone be healthy. That should be the slogan of inclusion and those are the things that we need to have the founding principles when we design our policies and processes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sikshit. May I now call upon Afardita Pustina who is the Country Coordinator Kosovo Office, the EU Technical Assistance to Civil Society Organization in the Western Balkans and Turkey. She's from Macedonia. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, um, we, for, the, for the panelists, just a brief information. We're a bunch of uh, alumni uh, members of the Buteria Summer School for Global Governance based in Hamburg, and there's 140 of us that attended these past three days of events. Um, I come from a region in the Western Balkans, and this region is uh, um, known for its aspirations to become an EU member. However, uh, this is more or less uh, a weird relationship that we have with the EU because we have the invitation from them to, to you know, join their path. However, every time that we want to go in, we're not al allowed to, so it's a bit like a spam invitation. Um, in the context of this uh, event, um, the non-G20 region, which I represent, in fact, looks up to your region of G20 for a variety of reasons. Um, and I will mention only one uh, relatable um, 
example, for example, if there is an IT project in, in, in Kosovo where I come from, um, and we exhaust all the options for finding staff there for potential solutions, we're no longer worried because through Upwork we can actually contact somebody from India who will sort it out in probably 15 minutes. Um, yesterday and day before yesterday, a lot was talking about digital divide. In our context, the digital divide is not a problem of access to internet because in fact Kosovo does have the largest coverage of internet in the entire Europe. We have 94% of our uh, territory fully covered by internet, but for us it's a problem of content that we actually can access. Um, uh, co to contrast this uh, positive um, uh, uh, cipher. In fact, uh, if you select Kosovo as a country in the App Store and try to download YouTube, YouTube will not come up for a variety of accessibility reasons. So, uh, it's a really um, uh, there's really some uh, significant contrast there. Uh, yesterday, it was said that technologies can no longer be centralized, and we totally agree because our region is a char has characteristic of governments who apply cancellation culture when it comes to projects from the previous government. So if a previous government has undertaken projects that were funded by various donors, the likelihood of the next government, which is another political party, to cancel those is very high, which leaves the public interest totally hijacked and um, you know, at the hands of, uh, of those, those who lead. So this institutional know-how is an asset, I would say, in your, in your region. So we, anything that you can help us out to make our so solutions for the digital technologies uh, government-proof, if I may say, would help us out a lot. Um, why, what's in it for you to uh, deal with the non-G20 countries? Well, for example, our region was also subject to misinformation and because uh, there are countries in our region that are of Muslim majority, we were uh, subject to misinformation and actually uh, some of our um, the people from our region actually went to ISIS to contribute uh, to the violent extremism and uh, terrorism. So uh, in this regard, uh, had there been, uh, for example, GDPR uh, under the EU that would be applicable to us, okay, local um, countries actually adopted some parts of that, but it's not really enforced, we wouldn't be having uh, governments in the region uh, undertaking um, initiatives to put surveillance cameras in which, for which they call them as, you know, uh, for, for public interest, but in fact, to date, we will, not nev we will never know what will happen to that data that is with the surveillance cameras. And um, recently, in, a in essence, there were also cases of uh, personal information leak, and I'll take the case of Albania. The entire payroll list of the entire population came out from the tax administration, so there was last name, last name, and how much who is getting paid. This was outrageous, and I haven't heard that anybody has been, um, you know, uh, chased for it. So, in essence, uh, to conclude on a on a on a positive note, as I said, we look up to you. When you think about your region, kindly asking you to also think outside of your region, outside of the G20, so that you prevent us consciously or subconsciously to do any provocation, uncertainty, or turbulence uh, in this world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Afadita. And on that note, we conclude this session. Uh, I want to thank uh, both Sharad and Karthik and all our expert uh, interventions. Mm -hmm.